Nine years after the first Wright brothers' flight, the U.S. Marines took to the air. On May 22, 1912, First Lieutenant Alfred A. Cunningham of the Marines reported to Naval Aviation Camp in Annapolis, Maryland, for duty in connection with aviation. As the number of Marine aviators grew, so did the avid desire to separate from Naval Aviation. February 17, 1917, saw the establishment of the first official Marine Flying Unit with the commissioning of the Marine Aviation Company for duty with the Advanced Base Force at the Philadelphia Navy Yard. With the U.S. declaration of war against Germany in 1917, the Navy and Marine Corps Air Arms entered a period of accelerated growth in manpower and equipment. The Marine Corps' primary goal was to send a brigade to France to fight alongside the Army. The first Marine Aviation Force deployed to France in July of 1918 and provided bomber and fighter support to the Navy's day wing, Northern Bombing Group. By the end of the war, several Marine aviators had recorded air-to-air -air kills. Collectively, they had dropped over 14 tons of bombs. The end of World War I saw Congress authorize 1,020 men for marine aviation and the establishment of permanent air stations at Quantico, Paris Island, and San Diego. The United States also embraced its role of global power and the Marine Corps became the preferred force for military intervention and where the Marines went, so went marine aviation. During the Banana Wars, while fighting bandits and insurgents in places like Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua, Marine aviators began to experiment with air-ground tactics and make the support of their fellow Marines on the ground their primary mission. It was in Haiti that Marines began to develop the tactic of dive bombing, and in Nicaragua, where they began to perfect it. In 1939, the Navy's General Board published a new mission for marine aviation. It stated marine aviation was to be equipped, organized, and trained primarily for the support of the Fleet Marine Force in landing operations and in support of field troop activities. Secondarily, it was a replacement for carrier-based naval aircraft. On December 7, 1941, the day of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Marine aviation consisted of 13 flying squadrons and just 230 aircraft. World War II would see the Marine Corps' air arm once again expand rapidly. They would reach their peak number of units with five air wings, 31 aircraft groups, and 145 flying squadrons. For the first two years of the war, the Air Arm spent most of its time protecting the fleet and land-based installations from attacks by enemy ships and aircraft. This began to change after the Battle of Tarawa, as the air support for ground troops flown by Navy pilots left much to be desired. After the battle, General Holland Mad Smith recommended that Marine aviators be thoroughly schooled in the principles of direct air support. To this day, it is the combined arms doctrine that makes the Corps unique. During the course of the war, Marine aviators were credited with shooting down 2,355 Japanese aircraft while losing 573 of their own aircraft in combat. They had 120 aces and earned 11 medals of honor. Immediately following the war, the strength of the Marine Corps flying arm was drastically cut as part of the post-war drawdown of forces. The post-World War II era saw the transition from propeller to jet aircraft and the development of the helicopter for use in amphibious operations. The first Marine Jet Squadron came in November 1947 when VMF-122 fielded the FH Phantom. On June 25th, the North Koreans attacked with nine well-equipped infantry divisions, spearheaded by one armored division equipped with Soviet-built T-34 tanks. The Republic of Korea forces were no match for the invaders. 
Seoul fell on June 28th, and the near collapse of South Korea forced the U.S. and U.N. forces to race to its aid. The first Marine strikes of the war launched on August 3rd, with VMF-214 sending eight F-4U Corsairs to fly close air support for U.S. and Republic of Korea soldiers near Busan. By August 7th, VMFs 214 and 323 were flying continuous close air support, or CAS sorties, ahead of the Marine and Army troops on the ground. The World War II vintage Corsairs, armed with rockets and napalm, were an effective combination throughout the entire war, but especially during these early days of the war. Short-legged jets could not loiter above the battlefield, and airfields in country were not yet available. Flying from carriers allowed more on-station time. Thus, it fell to the veteran Leatherneck Corsairs to carry the war in the beginning. The first Marine jets arrived with VMF-31 on December 10th. The unit flew its first combat missions that afternoon. The Marines had developed CAS during the Philippine campaign of January 1945 and made this coordination between aircraft and requesting ground units their own special field of operations. The Marine Corps is really the only service that is totally self-supporting. We have our ground troops, we have our helicopters to get them in and get them out, we have our jets that provide close air support and uh, make strategic strikes and um, we don't have to really, well, I guess we rely on the Navy to get us there to, to venues where we need to be, but we, we basically support our own. CAS by F-9F Panther jets brought in a new discipline, which took into account the aircraft's high speed and reduced range. There was also concern about the Panther's shallower dive angle because of the jet's higher speed. This reduced angle increased the fighter's exposure to its own bomb fragments after delivery. From the Navy and Marine Corps standpoint, air-to-air -air action was sporadic, with the Air Force seeing most of the engagements against communist aircraft. As the spring and early summer of 1953 proceeded, the Marine squadrons kept up the pressure, flying countless sorties against enemy lines and installations. Sometimes, their attention made the difference between a communist victory and an outpost remaining in Marine hands. Finally, word came that July 27th would be the last day of the war. Even as the 7,000 men of the 1st MAW prepared to stand down, the Wing's aircraft flew 222 sorties on that final day. Captain William I. Armagost of VMF-311 flew the last jet mission of the war against Chinese supply areas in the late afternoon, 35 minutes before the ceasefire was to take effect at 1910 hours. The legend of marine aviation was an intoxicating lure for a new generation of Marines. I guess like everybody else, when I was growing up in the 50s, we watched Victory at Sea and saw the Second World War. I was born in 41, so when the war ended, I was five or six years old. And you know, all the men came back and they were heroes and you saw all the the films of the air battles and the ground battles and I took one look at all those films and said, you know, I don't think I want to be in the mud and the, and, uh, in the trenches that I'd, I'd really like to fly airplanes. It, that really looked exciting. So uh, I guess that was sort of in the back of my mind and I always felt like that we had an obligation, that one had an obligation to serve his country in some way. So when, uh, when I came of age, 18 years old and registered for the draft, said I'd rather go where I want to go and join the best. I think the Marine Corps is the best. I want to be part of the best. I think the best of the best is the air wing of the United States Marine Corps. So that's why I, that's why I joined the Marine Corps. Northcutt used college to achieve his goal. When I was a freshman, I went to visit the recruiter 
and signed up for the platoon leaders class. And the platoon leaders class was six weeks at Quantico, Virginia at the end of my freshman year and at the end of my junior year. And I did those two summer camps. And when I graduated, I got a, a commission as a second lieutenant. For Northcutt, second lieutenant's bars were not enough. He wanted wings. And um, I told him that I wanted to fly. I wanted to be on the air wing of the Marine Corps. But a medical condition seemed to have grounded that dream. And I had to take some, uh, some medical tests. I had hay fever. And uh, they said, well, you can't, you can't uh, fly if you've got allergies. So I had some tests done, and my doctor wrote a letter. Um, it really had nothing to do with having hay fever. He wrote a letter that said that, um, and I had a copy of it that said, Alan is a fine young man, he'd be a credit to the Marine Corps. After clearing his medical, the real tests began, including one very strange question. And the one question that I remember from the psychological test is he asked, asked would you rather be known as a snob or a slob? And I'm sure the correct answer was you'd like to be known as a, slob, as a snob. Marine aviators are built from the ground up. I went to um, Pensacola, Florida, to the, um, the Navy, uh, the Marine Corps flight training goes through the Naval Aviation Flight Training Program. You start in Pensacola, Florida with six weeks of, of ground school, just learning the theory and, and mechanics of flying. And then you go to basic flight at Softly Field and fly the T-34. And uh, that was very rigorous. After ground training, Northcott went home to get married and a very short honeymoon. I went in early August, um, and I got married in early September. And uh, four weeks into the program, I went to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, from Pensacola. Got married on a, on a Saturday, came back on, on Sunday night, and right back into the program Monday morning. After taking the plunge into marriage, Northcutt took another one on the Monday after his wedding. And on Monday morning, we had the exercise called the Dilbert Dunker. And the Dilbert Dunker, you got into a cockpit of an, of an airplane, of a T-34. You strapped in, and it was on rails that went into the swimming pool. And you, you strapped in, and it went down the rails and flipped upside down. So you had to, you had to unstrap and swim out of the, out of the uh, upside down cockpit. And that was my introduction uh, uh, after you know, coming back from getting married. After 18 months of training, Northcutt had his wings and was off to Pensacola for a new challenge. Marine and naval aviators are unlike any flyers anywhere in the world. Not only do they have to master the hottest combat aircraft, but they also have to learn how to operate from the pitching deck of a modern carrier. We flew the T-2A up there for six months, learning how to fly a jet airplane, which is a lot faster. You have, it, you have to think faster than a little prop that goes 120. And um, it's been six weeks there. Just learning to fly it, fly in formation, uh, doing some navigation uh, exercises. And you're there six months, then you go to, uh, back to Pensacola, Florida for carrier qualifications. We had six weeks of landing on an aircraft carrier deck painted on a runway in the swamps. A real shock for the new jet aviator came with his first cat launch. That's the catapult that throws you off the front of the, sh of the ship. The, the airplane, it's the, the carry deck's not long enough for the plane to accelerate to flying speed. So it's a big hydraulic uh, piston that they strap onto your airplane and you salute and put your hand back on the stick and that indicates to the flight officer that you're ready to go and you have your hand uh, cupped behind the, behind the throttle 
so that it won't come back. You put the friction knob on and you put your hand, your, your right hand, your right elbow in your stomach so that you can't pull back on the stick and put your head against the headrest. They hit the button and it fires you off the front of the deck at about 140 miles an hour. You go 140 in about two feet. In the early 60s, there was no such thing as a top gun school for Marine and Naval flyers, but there was Cherry Point. Here, Northcutt learned air combat in the F-4 Phantom. Well, I went from Pensacola, Florida and carrier qualifications down to uh, Kingsville, Texas for advanced jet. And when I graduated from there, I went to Cherry Point, North Carolina. And it was just sort of like going to flight school all over again. You know, where you learned to fly the F-4, you had an instructor go with you a few times, and then you flew formation and you learned air-to-air uh, uh, -air combat. And I guess that was in January. We were there six or eight months. And, um, uh, you know, it was peacetime, and you just flew every day, and there was a readiness. You just need to be ready if something happened. Northcutt was training for war, but did not really think he would soon be fighting in one. We figured we'd put in our three years and then um, maybe stay in. Nobody really had any idea of whether they wanted to be a career uh, Marine officer or go back to civilian life. After Cherry Point, Northcutt was ordered to Puerto Rico. And about October, we heard the word came down that we're going to get deployed down to Puerto Rico, to Roosevelt Roads. And um, Roosevelt Roads was a, a bombing and gunnery and air-to-air -air combat uh, training site. So we went down there uh, right before Thanksgiving, and we spent Thanksgiving to Christmas time down there. Not only were Northcutt and his fellow Marines learning valuable lessons about close support, they also learned where their next duty station would be. We were trained by some pilots that had, that had come back from Vietnam. And, and when we first met them, they said, I bet you guys don't know where you're going. And we said, well, yeah, we're going back to Cherry Point when we finish this. And they said, no, you're not. You're going to Vietnam. In, uh, June of 66, we packed up and went to Vietnam. Each man deals with a call to combat in their own way. I'm not sure I gave it a whole lot of thought. It was a job to do, you know, that we were, you know, it was part of being in the Marine Corps, that if the call came to go serve in combat, that's where you went. And I was committed to that and excited about going. I was excited about going, but I was a little afraid that I'd never been in combat before. And the guys that came back, um, they hadn't lost anybody. Um, they hadn't had any air-to-air -air combat. It had been all close air support of, of the ground troops. Um, I was, I guess I was most apprehensive about doing my job well, about being able to deliver the, the bombs and the rockets and the napalm, you know, accurately to support the ground troops. Being in country took some adjustment. I remember when I got there, um, I guess the, the scaredest I was, was flying in on the Northwest transport plane, Northwest Airlines you know, flying into Da Nang. You know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to sit on a phone book because I was sure bullets were gonna come up through the bottom of the airplane. But they didn't and we got on the ground. Everybody was walking around just like they were back in Cherry Point, North Carolina. Because the base was secure and, you know, the ground troops had perimeter defenses around Da Nang Airport. And we didn't really have to worry about, it. after three or four days, I relaxed. The education of a marine aviator did not stop once you were in country. And I remember my, my, probably my second or third mission, I got a couple of familiarization flights with a, um, they put a, another pilot in the back seat uh, of the F-4 
and we'd go out and fly around and, and um, uh, just sort of look at the area, see where everything was. I guess we got two or three of those flights. The primary aircraft flown by the Marines in Vietnam was the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom III. The F-4 was a tandem, two-seat, twin-engine, all-weather, long-range, supersonic jet interceptor fighter bomber. We would probably come in around 3,000 feet or stay down low. Um, our bombing pattern um, was we, we rolled in. We're going 540 knots, and that's the speed that you're supposed to drop your bombs at. And we're at, we're at 6,000 feet. And, and you, you roll in, you dive bomb with, at a 30 degree angle, um, and you dive down to 3,000 feet, and you, you release your bombs at 3,000 feet, and you pull out at 1,500 feet, because when the bomb hits the ground, it hits the ground probably about the same time you hit 1,500 feet. And if, if you go low, the bomb fragments can come up to 1,500 feet. And a number of guys have shot themselves down by going lower than that and having the fragments from their bombs shoot them down. For the marine aviators, the most heart-pounding missions were those from the hot pad. The Marines always had at least two aircraft sitting by the runway on what was called a hot pad. The planes had been pre-flighted and were hooked up to a compressor starter ready to take off. The alert pilots were in their gear in a trailer waiting nearby. On the missions where they're, they're off the hot pad, which is in response to some ground guys being, being in trouble, you're, you're focused on getting those, on saving those guys, on helping save those guys. I mean, they're, in the, they're doing the hard work. I mean, they're in the jungle, they're face to face with the bad guys. I mean, they're 50 feet away from them, if that far away from them. You know, we're flying around in an air-conditioned airplane. You know, and we're, we're removed from, you know, the, the personal nature of the war. And we want to do the best that we can do to make their job easier and, and get them out of trouble. Within 15 minutes, the ground troops would have jets overhead ready to drop their payloads in support of the mud marines. I guess one of the most exciting times is we got, we got scrambled off the hot pad and the, the overcast was down like 50 feet. And I was a wingman um, and had a leader, there were two of us. And we took off and we took off in section, uh, which is because the overcast was so low, you usually took off like 30 seconds apart and then joined up after you got airborne. Uh, but that day, it was, um, the overcast was so low that we took off together. The mission was to support the Marines along the DMZ. They were flying fast and on the deck. We were going up north toward the demilitarized zone and I had to fly on his wing at 50 feet. And we were going down the beach right on the beach, right at the breaker line, at 50 feet. And, um, and I started getting concerned that if he turns into me, if you, if you look at the plane that you're on, if I'm here and he's here and he turns into me, I drop down and I'm gonna go into water. So they didn't teach us how to do it, but I stepped up, you always step down when you fly formation. You put the, the wingtip light in the pilot's helmet's ear, and you just maintain that relative position and don't look at anything else, and you just stay right there. Well, I had to, I had to step up so if he turned into me, I wouldn't go in the water. After a 10-minute run up the coast, Northcutt and his leader were over the target just as the sky cleared. So we went up the beach, and we got up around um, around the demilitarized zone, and there was some um, some Viet Cong in a cave up on a in a ridge line, and the ridge line the, the overcast lifted up a little bit to maybe oh five hundred to a thousand feet. The ground marines had popped smoke and radioed the location of the target. They were in a cave up on the ridge line, right underneath the top of the overcast or the bottom of the overcast, 
and the, our ground troops were down in the rice paddies and they were pinned down. And, and there wasn't any way to get to these caves with our bombs um, you know, by dive bombing, which is the only way we'd ever been taught. So, um, so we devised loft bombing, what we, we just improvised, which is a Marine Corps specialty, um, uh, loft bombing, which is we came in right on the deck, down around 50 feet, and then pulled up sharply to hit the target, Northcutt would have to thread a needle. We, we aimed right at the cave, and, and as, we, as we approached the ridge line, we pulled up in a 4G turn, and then released the bombs where the bombs would be going up, and then we split off away from the direction that we were going. Northcutt was on target. My first bomb went right in the cave. And you know, it was just luck that it went in there. But um, that's what we were trying to do, and, and it worked. And the ground guys got out, and everybody was happy, except the guys in the cave. I guess they weren't very happy. <laughs> For Alan Northcutt, there are no doubts about his decision to become a Marine. I think some of the best days of my life have been in the United States Marine Corps. Um, it's, you know exactly what your mission is, and you do it, and it's a team, it's a family. There's just one mission, and everybody's dedicated to getting it accomplished.